We finally had a couple days of clear weather, so it was time to get to work on the observatory again. It began with a small job, just drilling some of the hooks into the power poles to hold up the extension cord high and dry off the ground on nights that the observatory would be running. Eventually, I plan to put up solar power around the observatory farm and give it its own power system. But that's a ways off yet, one thing at a time. Anyway, this part of the job is simple. Just drill a hole into the sides of these 10-foot poles, which are dug into the ground about 2.5 feet, and screw in some stainless steel rubber-treated hooks. While these poles are pressure-treated to resist the deleterious effects of all the humidity in Nova Scotia's air. The rubber on the hooks is very important to help stop moisture from getting into those holes and causing rot on the inside. Even so, I figure these poles should be good for at least 5, maybe 10 years. And their purpose is just to hold the extension cords high and dry off the ground because Nova Scotia summer nights can become incredibly dewy, almost like a light rain. And their job is to keep the extension cords, particularly where they come together, high and dry above that damp surface. With that done, and with this good weather finally here, it's time to pick up where we left off and start getting those walls up. That begins by taking those frames that I assembled last week before the storm came and using a few 6-inch wood clamps to hold them all together while I get them squared and exactly positioned around the pier. Then, we unclamped one side at a time and ran some DAP 230, a water seal, around the base of the frame to prevent rain and meltwater from working its way into the observatory. When the time comes, I'll seal off the inner decking inside the walls to minimize the flow of humidity into the observatory. Summer air in Nova Scotia can be incredibly humid and controlling the flow of humidity is very important in keeping the equipment operating, functional and not rusting. Once the walls are all nicely squared up, I'll clamp them into place again and then I'll use a few three inch screws to just tack it into place till we're ready to really fix it down good. This is just to keep the base of the frame from moving while we do the other exterior preparatory work before we finally put down the foundation screws, which are large, tough, six and a half inch screws that will go right into the joist of the deck and really lock the observatory structure into place. Right here is where the door is going to go. It's going to be about 48 inches high and I'm just laying in the upper part of the frame. It's a fairly simple procedure. I'll put in a vertical bar there and later on a crossbar. And every step that I'm taking is intended to make the structure as strong as possible. Winter winds in Nova Scotia can get pretty severe. And occasionally we're hit by a hurricane, usually the tail end of one that's petering out. But I've always been a fan of overbuilding. Better to overbuild once than underbuild twice. All right, when that board is leveled up with the lines that I've pre-marked on the vertical struts, I'm going to lock it in place with a few 3-inch wood screws and then move on to the next phase. I've chosen to go with all screw construction on the observatory. One reason for this is that if later I decide to make any design changes, screws can be removed neatly and easily, and usually without damaging the wood. There's also the reality that nails are held in place by friction, and Nova Scotia's rapid and large humidity changes can open up the holes that hold nails, giving them much less holding power than screws. Here I'm driving in one of the substantial six and a half inch foundation screws. These are heavy galvanized steel screws that are designed to lock structures down to their foundations. About a dozen will go into each wall of the structure. When it's done, we'll go back to some of the fine work, such as preparing the opening for the door. That's another area that I want to be especially strong. And each strut and beam that's put into there, I'm going to take extra special care to make sure it fits exactly perfectly to provide good lateral and vertical strength. This often involves making a cut of wood slightly too long, like maybe an eighth of an inch, and then shaving off a sixteenth or even a thirty-second of an inch at a time until the part just perfectly fits in like a puzzle piece, like here. When each piece is properly positioned, we'll get back to fixing it into place with more three-inch wood screws. And by the time it's done, I hope to have a rock-solid opening, not only to hold the door, but the door side of the structure will be a bit weaker than the other sides, and I want to make sure that it's good and solid to hold up to those winter winds. And with that out of the way, we go back to some of the last work on the frame, getting the beams bolted in across the top to maximize the frame's strength, and prepare it for the sliding roof that will go on later. And that's pretty much the end of a day's work. 
On day two, we begin cutting up the LP Smart siding, which is an upgrade of T111 siding, sometimes known as wrench wall siding, which will form the outer walls. Once the walls are pre-cut to go on, my wife Daphne and I put Tyvek house wrap around the entire structure to minimize the inclination of draft to move through the wood. And then, at last, it's time to start connecting the walls. And by the end of day two, the walls were on. On day three, I went over the wall and caulked all the joins and corners. And with that, the lion's work of getting the outer part of the observatory structure is finally done. I still have to build a door, and then of course there is the roof. And I'm not fully decided on the design of the roof yet, but we'll get there. And hopefully, by the end of the next episode, we'll have the roof on the observatory. At which point, I guess we can say, it really is functional, though there will yet be a lot of internal work to do.